Hey, what's up YouTube? This is Eric and I'm back with the commentary version of my most recent coupe build, the 4.0 easy to clean portable coupe. As you can tell here, I started off with some pretty basic plans and sort of adapted them as I went. This in the end is the final product that I ended up with. You'll see in the next shot here. And um, there are a couple things that I would change about this. We'll get into those in this video. And certainly if you have any questions, feel free to ask them down below. My goal here is that if you hope to build this coupe that you'll be able to tackle it uh, with the help of both this video and the comments section. So let's get into it. In this first clip, you'll see me, I'm just gonna buzz off like the end, maybe eighth inch of this piece of wood. You never really want to assume that those are square. They pretty rarely are. And then in this shot, just another general skill you'll see me do throughout this video is if you're intending to cut a wood to a particular length, you want to make sure that you leave the line when you make your cut. And that's gonna make sure that you don't end up with pieces of wood that are consistently like a millimeter or two millimeters short. So I left the line there. Um, the width of the cutting blade is called the kerf, and you wanna make sure that your kerf doesn't make all of your pieces of wood too short. All right, in this shot, I'm just fastening together my basic bottom framing here. Typically, when you get near the end of a piece of wood, you would want to pre-drill, but this uh, particular pressure-treated lumber was so wet, um, it wasn't cracking even without pre-drilling. So you, don't, you won't see me do that too often, except once I get into some of more of the complicated pieces where I really wanted to make sure that it didn't crack. These are, I guess, uh, probably th maybe three and a half inch deck screws that I'm using, and you really want to have the, uh, I guess it's called the star drive head on them. If you just go with a regular Phillips, it's going to be a nightmare. You'll be stripping screws left and right. So I would say spend a little bit more. I really like, uh, as I said, the deck mate screws. No, they're not giving me anything for this. Those are just usually uh, the screws that I go with. And then in that previous shot, you just saw me take off maybe like a quarter inch um, along the length of this, this vertical piece that I'm screwing on now. I was trying to be conscious as I was building this of just trying to cut out where I could any additional weight given that this is going to be a portable coupe in the end. Sort of a chicken tractor sort of design. Now I think I did go back later on in the final final videos that I'll show you of this coupe. I think I maybe went back and added some uh, lag bolts in here or maybe even carriage bolts. Um, the lag bolt is going to be the one that has the nut on the end and then the I'm sorry, other way around. The lag bolt has no nut on the end, and the carriage bolt will have a nut on the end. You wanna make sure that any sort of screws you're using in this pressure-treated wood is rated for pressure-treated wood because, um, well, for one, you wanna make sure that the screws are gonna last outdoors, um, and also I think the, the pressure-treated wood itself is corrosive to some kinds of screws, so just make sure you get the good ones for decks. And then in this shot, you'll see, first off, I um, there's a screw in the very bottom that I'm actually not screwing into the wood any further. I'm taking that out now. I just had that in place to hold up the, the board while I was screwing it into place. And then in this shot, you'll see, typically I try to put my screws in before, before I hold the piece of wood up. That, so you're not trying to juggle um, setting the screws in and also tightening them and holding up the other board all at the same time. Um, I have no idea why I didn't screw those in more center than I did. That really annoys me. I think maybe there was possibly a knot in there or something I was trying to avoid, but um, I have no idea. All right, so you see the basic dimensions here. I did make a couple changes, particularly at the nest bo nesting box end. It actually ended up, the nesting box ended up being a little bit longer than I had first intended. And that actually caused some problems later on in the build, which I'll get to when I talk about the nesting boxes. Hopefully with this video and the dimensions I have written on the wood here, and eventually the plan, which will end up in the description, hopefully you'll be able to get through this section. It's really just repeat of a lot of skills that you'll see throughout this video. And, but yeah, like I said, ask if you have any questions. That end that's closest to us now, that will end up becoming the nesting box portion. It was just a little bit longer than I had initially intended for it to be.
So I actually don't have a shot of me cutting down the um, plywood to size, but I cut a piece of plywood to cover both the coop portion and also the nesting box portion. And then in this shot, I'm just securing the perimeter of it all the way around the outside. And I also pop into the middle and put a couple screws down that center joist in there too. And then in this, I'm just trying to um, smooth out, especially that top edge, I, um, I'm gonna put linoleum on in the next step, so I really tried to focus on the corners. I didn't wanna end up with um, any corners poking through the linoleum, so I was mostly just trying to smooth that off a little bit. If you go all the way back to my very first coop video, maybe 2012 or something, 2013, 14, something in there, I put a piece of linoleum in the bottom of the coop, and at the time I think that I was the only person doing that, at least on YouTube. A lot of YouTube videos now have that same thing, and um, I will say, from a uh, keeping things clean perspective, I would definitely not uh, skip this step. It goes a long way. It, it's really, really easy to sweep out your, your bedding and your uh, bird droppings and all that um, with, if you have the, the, the linoleum on there. All right, then I'm just gonna go around here and I'm gonna staple this, um, sort of stretching it as I go, and then I'll probably pop over to the other side, put in a staple there. The section is just a little bit different in terms of how I had to wrap it, so that's why I, had, um, that's why I included this, this clip separately. There's actually supposed to be a trap door in this coop. I remember that after about a quarter of the way into the build probably I remembered about the trapdoor so I actually had to undo some stuff. Before I did all of this I should have actually done the framing and the uh, cutout for the trapdoor but um, later in the video you'll see me do that. Just be aware that if you're trying to build this coop while you're watching this video um, that's something that's a step that I a step that I accidentally skipped initially. All right so that line there um, what I'm about to frame out is the um, access door that, that the uh, chickens are going to use to come in and out of the coop. I think when you see the final framed up wall at the end of this whole clip, you'll, it'll sort of make sense as to what all these individual parts are doing. You see I just have my speed square in there, uh, just trying to make sure that this wall stays um, at a good 90 degree right angle as I, as I finish this step. You'll also see me get out my speed square for the same reason like during my nesting box framing and uh, probably a couple other times in this build. I had mentioned there were some issues with the dimensions on the nesting box end, but I think all the, all the markings and all the dimensions you see written on these pieces of wood here, um, you should be good to go with those. In my final coop plan, I'll obviously include um, these dimensions too, but if anybody's too eager uh, or really eager to get started on this before I actually get those plans released in a, in a few weeks, um, you should at least have a good starting point. As you can see here, I just cut that main, um, the top plate piece, the one that sort of runs the, 
along the whole top surface. I cut that an inch and a half short because of how I will end up framing my nesting box. That's why I held up that little tiny scrap of wood just to demonstrate it's an inch and a half short. All right, so this is all the stuff that I had completed when I realized that I forgot the trap door. So I had to go back and pull all the staples just in this corner so I could get um, to be able to make my cuts in, in the uh, plywood here. I briefly thought about trying to do this, um, do these cuts through the linoleum, but as they say, haste makes waste. And I wanted to make sure I didn't mess up a $25 piece of linoleum trying to rush through it. So I did unscrew that top framing stuff and just put, put it off to the side. I think I'm screwing out these corners because I thought uh, I was planning on initially using my jigsaw for it, but the blade of the jigsaw kept rubbing against the framing, the outside corner framing there. Um, it was a little bit too close to it with where I drew my line and where I drilled my holes, so I just decided to use the circular saw. This is called a plunge cut that I'm doing right now. You have to sort of pull back the guard and then just sink your blade into the wood while it's already running full speed. That's probably one of the trickier cuts in this build. Um, and you definitely want to make sure you practice it not on your coop platform piece of plywood before you uh, attempt it. It's a little bit of a learning curve on that, I would say. All right, so obviously I just, um, I found the corners of where the actual plywood was cut and then I, I cut my, my linoleum. Um, I'm just gonna fold it up here and staple it. If you have sort of an off-brand um, stapler, you might find that it has a tough time going into the plywood and maybe even the pressure-treated wood. Um, it's probably worth investing in a good staple gun for this. I'm pretty pleased with the one I have, but there's a lot of good brands out there. And believe it or not, this was probably one of the most obnoxious parts of this build. Um, trying to get this linoleum to wrap and then get it stapled on there. Um, I sort of did it by putting a, a good bit of excess on there when having the excess allowed me to pull it tight and then I was able to cut off the excess after I had it stapled on. I had thought about going with two smaller um, hinges for this. I really like the sturdiness of this big one and plus um, some of those screws ended up almost out like halfway th into the into the door itself. I really like, seems pretty sturdy to me. I don't think I'll have issue with there only being one hinge on this one with how big that is. At the very end of this video, you'll see um, I do have like a little, what's it called? Some kind of bolt which um, will secure that so it doesn't just pop open as a chicken's sitting on it. And then in this shot, I'm re-securing all of the parts that I had to unscrew to do that trap door. All right, in this shot, I'm adding an additional piece of wood over top of that bottom one. I'm gonna actually, ultimately, you'll see in the final shot, I add a I had another piece over top of both of those. Um, I really wanted to make sure that bottom end was um, really sturdy because that's where the wheels ended up. Thank you. 
And this little cutoff that I'm about to make, I'm gonna use it at the top um, where the two rafter pieces come together just to join them. You'll see I'll put four screws on this piece to join the, where, right, where the, right where the ridge of the roof is. I'm not sure if I, I guess I did not pre-drill this. It probably would have been a good idea for me to do that, both in this shot and in the next one. Yeah, you see I did not pre-drill that. I don't remember if it cracked a little bit or not. Especially toenailing when you're going in at an angle, that seems to be when the wood really wants to split. All right, then in putting these rafters on, I believe um, there's a triangle that you see there. Um, I think that's called a bird's mouth cut. And that's gonna be where your rafter sort of sits on top of your wall framing. Sorry, we're coming up on some stuff that's really difficult to explain while I'm um, sort of on the fly here. So here I'm just cutting out that bird's mouth cut. And then um, with the way that I framed my nesting box, I kept having an issue with um, the nesting box. It, it couldn't open properly because the roof, um, the bottom of the roof was so close to where it was trying to open up. So um, I actually ended up having to cut off an additional little corner at the bottom here just to give a little more clearance for the box, for the nesting box lid, lid to open up. So you actually see, um, when I edited my videos together, um, in this clip you see that that bottom piece is still attached, but in one of these I have cut it off to try to make the like I said, the, the issue with the nest, to, to try to uh, solve that issue with the nesting box. Sorry, some of this stuff is just pretty difficult to describe on the fly here. All right, so I'm just pre-drilling these rafters. Um, there's going to be probably a four inch screw that goes in through the rafter and into the um, top plate of this wall underneath it. After I put those um, four inch screws in, I, it probably would have been enough to just leave it there, but I decided to go back and put these little um, corner pieces in that will really just make sure that the uh, rafters can't move side to side at all. Um, I think with some of these diagonal screws that are going in here, I think I probably caught the bottom of that rafter piece, which will also help hold it down. Um, but yeah, in this shot, you have a good look. That's, that's how it got cut off at the end. That's what I was working on before. All right, so the other day when I was trying to record this, I absolutely gave up on this section because I did it about 20 times and it kept getting worse. So it's a new day today and I'm hoping that this goes a little bit better here. There were really three factors that were difficult in this section. I think I alluded to earlier in the video here that the nesting box was a little bit longer than I had originally planned for. Um, and that caused three different sorts of issues, I guess I'll say, uh, or three different considerations I had to keep in mind. Um, the first is that obviously the hen needed to have the hens needed to have enough space inside of the nesting box they, um, to lay their eggs inside of there. Uh, but the other two factors were the roof needed uh, the nesting box roof needed to have adequate pitch. And then the third factor is the roof of the nesting box couldn't lift up and smack into the roof above it. So with all three of those factors, um, I had to, like I said, I, um, I couldn't really skimp on the giving the hen the space inside of the nesting box. Um, you'll see that I have a 10% pitch to this roof, which really is the bare minimum of what you'd want. And also um, this, the lid of this nesting box doesn't lift open quite as wide as I would love it to. So um, when I do the plans for this, you'll see it, it's gonna look a little bit different. Um, the pieces are all gonna be just a little bit shorter. Um, like I said, in part, or mostly that was caused by the length of the nesting box really threw things off in terms of um, the measurements here. So 
Hopefully that makes some sense. If you have any questions, ask them in the comments and I'm going to press on. Sorry, that section was probably painful and I'm sorry if some of you are thinking about leaving. I promise this uh, next section is a little bit easier to explain. In the shot, I'm just attaching a little block of wood underneath that, um, that the last framing piece of the nesting box so that when I go to screw it down, it doesn't wanna keep sliding down um, the piece of wood that I'm attaching it to. And what you're gonna see me do here is I will actually pre-drill this piece. I'm gonna go in straight here and I'll go in straight here and then I'm gonna angle it um, to, to make my, my diagonal drill, um, drill hole. If you try to go in diagonal right off the bat, the drill bit just wants to keep sliding across the piece of wood. So I'll go in straight and then diagonal it and that will, that will help. And with that block of wood under there, this is the step that that um, upper piece is going to want to keep sliding if you don't have the block of wood under there. But this makes it pretty easy. You'll see throughout this coop build, I use blocks like that, especially building, um, if you're building by yourself, it just helps almost give you another hand, um, make it a lot easier. All right, so you see there's a little tiny gap between the two screws um, and where I drilled that hole. I'm just gonna put one, probably four inch screw into this horizontal piece that's in my hand now. And then I also came with this uh, sort of corner wedge piece um, just to try to make this even a little bit more stable than it was before. You know, it might seem like overkill, but um, if this coop ever has to be built or if it ever has to be lifted, the nesting box portion is, is one portion that someone is going to uh, be lifting on. So you sort of want to think about that when you build anything that might eventually get moved. Um, how will someone be lifting it? This, this part has definitely got to be a little beefier than the other sections because of that. All right, um, you see there's actually one more vertical support that I put in there. And then the corner bracket on the other side. Um, before I start this, I should say uh, you should really get a proper push block. I sort of, um, I'm using a, a little bit of a rigged up one here. It makes me nervous even watching this, but the table saw is probably the most dangerous uh, piece of equipment in anybody's shop, and I should be setting a better example with a, with a proper push block here. But um, even the DeWalt table saw comes with a little push stick. And I think I found that toward the end of this video, but I do not have it in my hand there. All right, so what you're seeing me doing um, here is I'm sort of cutting a channel in this piece of wood uh, by, by moving this, um, the table saw, maybe like a 16th of an inch at a time. I'm just gonna keep moving over that cut. So my next cut here is a little bit further over to the left than that first one. And now I'm gonna run it through again. And that slot in the middle is just gonna keep getting wider the more that I push this through here. And that's gonna be a track then for, um, I'm gonna have a little divider section that's gonna go between the two nesting box portions. Uh, I'll be able to remove that for cleaning just so I can pretty easily sweep the bedding from that close side of the nesting box over to the trap door section on the other side. So 
So if you're screwing in at an angle here, that's called toe. Um, if it's nailing, it's called toe nailing. I guess it would be called toe screwing if it's um, if you're screwing it at an angle. I did pre-drill this. Um, like I said, anytime when you're when you're toe nailing or toe screwing, that's when the wood really seems to want to split. And then um, and then you will see at the end of this coop video where I give the final tour, I uh, slightly modified the piece that I'm installing now. I just made it a little bit shorter so that uh, the separator piece could come out easily. Because as I said, the uh, nesting box lid doesn't open as far as I would want it to. So you see me here, you see me there, I was just measuring the height of the, the peak of the highest point of that uh, ridge of the roof there. And now in this shot, I am attaching some blocks to the bottom. Those aren't gonna be a permanent addition. I'm just putting them there to, to give myself something to set the T111 uh, plywood siding on there. And what, what you saw me do there was I slid the, the T111 back and forth a little bit. I was trying to make sure that the uh, decorative grooves in it didn't land sort of awkwardly at the end of um, at the end of the coop. You don't want like a decorative groove like let's say uh, half an inch from the end of your coop. It would just be a look a little bit goofy. Um, so here I'm clamping it on and I'm gonna finish that thought just in just a second here. So I clamped it and now I'm tracing it but what I didn't take into account here was that um, the ridge, uh, the end of the nest, the uh, coop portion, I'll put an arrow here so you know what I'm talking about. Um, I didn't take into account where that fell in relation to the groove. So you can see here, it did fall sort of awkwardly. I should have taken that into account. And then for the rest of the coop build, I did, in terms of sliding my T111 along there, I did take that into account. All right, what I'm about to do is one of a few miscuts that I made in this coop build. I should have been making a notch the size of a 2x4, which would be uh, 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches, and I have no idea what I did, where my brain was when I made this cut, because uh, I think it ended up being 4 inches by 1.5 inches. And the end result was that when it... Um, when I finally placed it in the end, it ended up being a half an inch too big of a, of a notch out of the top there. So that looks fine there until I pull that up tight to the top of the, uh, to the coop. Then there's a half inch too big of a gap there, which I ended up having to put some trim over in the end. On this side of the coop, this is the other side now, I did take into account where, the, um, where those decorative grooves were falling. And so it was a much better look on the other side then. Now the, the T111 siding, I really like the look of it from the decorative stance, uh, standpoint, but it does make it a little bit difficult in terms of like reusing scraps that you might have around because you ultimately want the, the grooves to be facing the right direction, vertical. Um, So that, that's super easy. I just pull it off. I'm just going to trace it, or I did trace it. I'm just going to jigsaw it, cut it out, um, just checking to make sure that it fits well before I reclamp it and do my next part here. So in this entire build, uh, my biggest regret from an aesthetic standpoint is I should have added one more 2x4 right in this section where I'm drawing right now to make sure that when I um, traced it, the door opening was centered on that big long on, on, the, uh, on that end. You'll see, I'll point it out in a later shot, um, that door opening is actually not centered which drives me crazy. Um, some of you may have noticed it. 
and if you haven't noticed it will now drive you crazy too so I'm sorry I actually was so frustrated about that I contemplated like undoing half of this coupe build and fixing it and then putting the thing back together but it would have been a pricey and also time consuming thing so I, I left it um, and this clip here I'm just cutting out this is the door that the chickens are going to go in and out of and again I'm just doing plunge cut on this with the circular saw and then I'm going to finish it up with this jigsaw and this last clip here is going to probably make you as nervous as it makes me because my hand is underneath there and I'm pretty sure well I didn't lose any fingers I can tell you that but I didn't want this piece of wood to go falling out and to splinter off because it was going to be a piece of wood that um, Obviously, we're going to be seeing it wasn't just going to be thrown out as a scrap. It was actually going to be going back onto the coop as the door. And I think now that that's in place, or now that the, that's been cut out, I was able to screw on this T111. You see, I just have little half inch blocks where I messed up that cut before. I'm taking those out now. Those were just holding up the piece of wood um, while I screwed it in. I can't stress enough the use of blocks to, to really make this a lot easier on yourself while you build. And I promise you won't think uh, you won't, the uh, little holes that those blocks leave, I promise you won't ever think about them again once you take those um, out of there. There's a saying in construction, you want to measure twice and cut once. Um, sometimes you want to measure three times or four times and cut once, especially um, like a sheet of this T111 is probably like 40 bucks now. And if you mess up, it could be a trip to the hardware store and also a really expensive mistake. All right, so in this clip here, you do see what I was talking about in terms of... Um, how it's not centered. I should have put another two by four right here, and I did not. And if I'd have put a two by four there, then the, the door would have been centered up on that, on that wall, which would have been much more aesthetically pleasing. All right, so that piece of wood is just to keep the bedding from falling out the door as the chickens go in and out. Again, you can see um, just not quite, not quite centered. I'm sure there's a better way of cutting this um, plexiglass. I just decided to put it on my table saw and it did a pretty decent job. And then I probably could have glued this into place or something, but I decided to just Screw it in with some washers to pinch it on there. And then this is just for a little bit of additional ventilation at the top. I think that the vent type that I'll put in here, I think that it's called a louver vent. Uh, so this one is maybe like four inches across or something like that. And initially I ended up using a plastic one, which you'll see in this clip. I actually took that out and then um, I ended up using a metal one instead, a little aluminum one I think. I was a little bit worried that an animal might be able to eat through that, a little um, possum or something would be able to get in through that. So this is a metal one and then I painted it black.
When it comes to chickens and frostbite, the one thing you really want to look out for is humidity inside of a cold coop. So it sounds a little bit um, counterintuitive, but you actually want good ventilation even over the winter time. But you want to make sure that it's not sort of a drafty sort of ventilation. Um, so this sort of, uh, this vent that I'm putting on here, it's going to let some of that humid air out, but it's really not going to let a huge cross breeze go blowing through this, which obviously would also not be good. So you want ventilation, but not draftiness. And this sort of vent that I'm putting on here should accomplish that. And here you have a look at the whole uh, finished product at the top with the rafters and the, and the uh, wedge pieces and then that ventilation hardware cloth. And now in this shot here, I am cutting my um, nesting box roof, cutting a 10, 10 degree angle at the top of that um, to where it meets up with the coop and then I'll probably also do a 10 degree angle on the bottom end where it, at the, for the very end of the nesting box. If you don't cut this angle, um, the nesting box is going to want to rub where it's against the main framing there. So even if you don't have a table saw, you're going to want to sand off this top corner uh, so that it doesn't rub when it opens and closes. And then I think that the angle of this top roof was maybe 30 degrees and I'm just sort of dry fitting this, putting it into place and I might, yeah, there I go, screwing it down too. So you can see in that shot, there was just not really much clearance between the top of the nesting box and the coop roof, and that's a change that I wish I had done. That's something I wish I had done differently. There's uh, two vertical pieces here in both of my hands. I wish those had been about a half an inch shorter because this horizontal piece that I'm about to lay across here, um, when I went to, to uh, nail it onto that piece of ply, the T111 underneath it, there's only like a maybe a half an inch lip that I was trying to catch with the nail gun. So you see that all the nails that I'm putting on here, I'm just having to stick to this very bottom end of the wood because that's where the T111 was underneath it. I should mention the finished nails that I was putting through there, a lot of them were poking through to the other side. I'll show you how I address that in an upcoming clip here. They, they were, I think they were inch and a quarter finished nails and so they popped out maybe like a half an inch or so on the other side and then I just had to buzz them off. These finished nails here are all going into the interior framing, they're not poking out into the coop.
So that last shot, I was just cutting like a little bit of an L corner bracket, corner piece to go over, um, to cover up where the, the seams of the T111 are. If I was smart, I would have painted all of my trim black before I put it on there. And I would have also painted the whole coupe blue before I put it on there. Uh, then I wouldn't have had to do so much uh, trim, like fine brush work at the very end, but I did not do it that way. This piece here is obviously additional sort of aesthetic decorative, but um, I'll put that on there. This build took so long, I think I got my hair cut twice during it and also grew and shaved two beards. <laughs> Alright, so you see in that shot, there were uh, a little bit of nails poking through to the back. And at first I snipped those off, as you can see here. And then in the next shot, I take the angle grinder with a flap disc and I buzz off all those little pieces that are still poking out just a little bit. Make sure that your sparks are going in um, away from your linoleum. You want to make sure that it doesn't burn a hole in that for sure. In this step, I'm building the access doors to, this will be what will let me put in food and water into the coop. Obviously, uh, it's something that will be getting opened and closed pretty often. And so I decided to go with a little sturdier approach to building these. Uh, this little jig in my hand is called a, a pocket hole jig. And the basic idea of it is that a screw going in at an angle is much stronger than a screw going into the end grain of a piece of wood. So um, just to make sure this was extra sturdy, I just decided to go this route for this one. I had some issues with the durability of this Craig pocket jig. Uh, the one piece keeps flying off of here. It's just made of plastic. Um, I'm really, really pleased with the basic idea, but um, yeah, there's a lot of companies that make pocket hole jigs, I'm sure now. And overall, I've been pleased with this Craig one, but you could probably go with any any company that gets good reviews on, reviews on that. And then the little pocket holes, the little slots that I'm screwing into now, um, they make little uh, wood plugs to put over that. You really won't even see them once I tap the plugs into those holes then. If you don't have a pocket hole jig, I probably wouldn't go out and get one just for this perfect uh, purpose. You could also maybe use some, um, like I think they're called maybe mending plates, little metal plates to just sturdy up those connections a little bit more. Um, you could probably also use, there's a screw called a headlock screw, I think. Um, it's really used for a really heavy duty decking screw, maybe like a five inch screw or so. Um, you could pre-drill those and put those in, that'd be nice and sturdy too. Um, but yeah, I would say don't go out and get a, uh, you probably don't have to go out and get a pocket hole jig. You could probably go without, like I said, it's just a little bit sturdier to do it the way that I did it. And then in this clip, I'm just finishing up some of the exterior framing. Um, between this shot and I think the final version, I think I maybe added an additional support yeah, I would have. It would have been like um, the rest of the framing for the coop, for the door access door underneath for the food and water. I think I had to add one additional vertical support there. Sorry, this is this video is about an hour long. I know that um, 
<laughs> I'm not explaining things overly well at some parts of this video. Sorry about that. And uh, I feel like my words are escaping me more the longer that this goes on. I just want to say, um, I know that uh, this is a very condensed version of this coupe build, but hopefully um, you're able to apply some of the skills that you learned in some parts to other parts, which maybe I didn't outline in such complete detail. Um, there's really not a whole lot of skills involved in making something like this. Uh, it's just a lot of repetition of similar sorts of cuts, similar sorts of screwing techniques. And yeah, in the end, hopefully the video, and like I said, ask questions if you have them, but hopefully this will be adequate if you're able to sort of apply some of the skills that you learn elsewhere. In this shot, I think I made a I made a miscut somewhere else. This was actually a piece of scrap wood, and I decided to just put a little splinter in there just to seal that up so no water was constantly getting in there. Plus, I just thought it'd be fun to give it a shot. So I tapped that into place, and then I snapped it off. And once it's painted, you would never know that it was there. All right, this ice and water shield, you see there's like sort of a black um, dotted line pattern at the bottom of the roof there. That's a line of tar that's gonna hold down the bottom row of shingles, um, make it stick to the roof. The ice and water shield has got an adhesive back on it. So that, that sticks that to the roof and then the shingle sticks to the ice and water shield. Um, you can see here, I also use the ice and water shield to um, right at this hinged joint. It's sort of a flexible material um, I used that in my first coop with great success. Uh, it lets the nesting box open and close. Uh, I didn't have issue over about the first f five years and then we, we moved, left that coop behind, but I never had issue with it uh, cracking or failing or anything like that. So I feel really good about how this is used here to seal the gap between that nesting box and uh, the portion that's gonna be opening and closing. If my nesting box had been a little bit shorter in length, then this, there could have been a little bit of a bigger gap between uh, the two roofs there, and that would have made things a lot easier in terms of working space. This is actually the first coop that I built with uh, traditional style shingles. So I watched quite a few YouTube videos on this, I, and I feel pretty good about the process, but I also didn't show too much of it because I'm not an expert and I don't feel like I'm as efficient with it. But the basic idea is uh, you wanna line up your shingles just like this, and then you wanna make sure that your joints are staggered so that water's not, you know, you don't wanna have one seam going uh, straight down without, it would let water in if your joints weren't staggered. So actually, poked my head inside and I realized that I missed that one rafter so I had to move over the um, move over the nail about a quarter inch and then I and then I filled up that hole just by tapping on it and then thank goodness we were at the last step here painting this uh, as I said this would have been a heck of a lot easier if I'd have painted the coupe blue and then um, painted the trim black and then put them all together but that's not the order that I did it in I also got pretty delayed in painting this. You really don't want to uh, treat, especially, uh, sorry, you don't want to paint pressure treated wood while it's still wet. So I had to leave that, uh, I let that sit for probably um, maybe five or six weeks. And even then, I don't know that it was really, really adequately dried, but I couldn't keep waiting on it. So then I painted it and that is that. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them down below. I will do my best to answer them. I hope to get the written portion of the uh, 
I hope to get the chicken coop plan posted on, in the uh, description of this video, hopefully in the next three weeks, um, certainly by the beginning of April. So check back often and please subscribe. I'll catch you around. See ya.